Alan, the expedition lifeboat, has not retreated back to his home yard back down near the River Thames estuary. You can breathe and relax once more. But now many weeks after we launched onto the water to start the long slog north, an excellent bloke from the Dauntless Yard called David got in touch, armed with a load of footage and photos of Alan's launch. Well, the launch episode has been and gone, but that's no reason to deny you the grandeur. Two things in particular. First, I do want to note the pretty impressive turning circle made possible by the new extended rudder, but the glaring shortcoming is the inability to shift the bow sideways when mooring. I know most small boats lack thrusters, but Alan's windage means he can fall victim to that, as well as the tides, when trying tight manoeuvres. If the workboat acting as a tug had been missing, I'd have probably needed a third attempt here. Anyhow, quality footage. Cheers. And although it may shock many, I actually had an evening off last night, which was good. But, back to Grimsby. And yes, that is a plank of wood sat next to Alan. But don't worry, I'm not swapping out the Apollo 11 interior decor for the cliched wood panelling so many boats end up with. Swiftly moving on without explanation, I've needed to cut some other things and found a 12 volt mini angle grinder online. This will really wind up the prestige brand snobs out there, but I'm delighted with it so far. And it was less than 30 quid, including two batteries. And on to Alan's engine. I mentioned a very slow leak from the front seal, so I checked the oil levels, which were at the lower end of OK. The Book engine's dipstick obviously has the low high range marker, a fairly narrow one, and a mystery cross etched into the metal. Any ideas what this cross means? Anyhow, more oil for Alan. I've gone for a top quality one, and since we're in far from Arctic conditions, I'm not opting for a low temperature viscosity just yet, and need to match the existing oil already in there. It pours through the port on the top cover, which is one of the more carefully thought through choices when it comes to accessibility. According to plenty of boat mechanics, Alan's engine is very accessible compared to some. Although the cowling wall gets in the way of getting the oil dipstick out without flicking oil on things. I also managed to smear some oil up the length of the metal the first time I checked, having glugged in some oil already. I jumped to the alarming conclusion that I'd overfilled, but having re-measured, all was well, and in went some more glugs. Around half a litre from about 50 hours motoring plus the front seal leak. Not bad consumption. This topic of the engine bay leads me conveniently to today's fix. Since the engine's fresh air needs are now ducted from outside the bay, the ambient air in there is not replaced, so heat has been building up during our 10 hour motoring runs. I knew I'd need some ducting even back in 2019, so put in a couple of screw ports in Alan's upper shell. So we'll do the duct, and duct clips are a good place to start. I'm basing it around a 50mm plastic, as the air is only going to be slightly warm, not truly hot. I'm running the main bay's extraction route directly up to the driver's seat. All the lengths of pipe need cutting to length, and that's where my new best friend springs, or spins, into action. I've cut a hole in the bay lid and mounted a socket, so it will not let any hot air end up trapped, and the rest of the routing ends up well above head height. I have some quality automotive flexi ducting hose to bridge complex shapes and angles, although there are some fixed angle mouldings too. Not bad, although I need to add a metal strut in front, otherwise people might yank the plastic, thinking it's a handrail. Time to mount the other duct, which is going to allow air to escape from the rear section of the bay, where the exhaust pipe meets the flange in Allen's transom. It gets hot there too. The whole stern face is coated in foam insulation of course, so I need to dig back to the fibreglass and bond on a couple of solid, raised anchor blocks. I can then recover and seal them up again, and use them as points on which to attach more of those clips. Perfect, and now a larger rectangular cutout for the most important part of the ducting, the fan box. This will have three ports cut into it, one that heads up and out the boat, one that brings in the hot air, and a smaller gland for the 24 volt power supply. This is what it will look like, minus the rear duct tube. I found a T-junction adapter, and it fits perfectly. The extractor fan will go on that side, drawing air into the box, with only one means of escape, out of the clear exit port and of course the boat. I'm running an electrical conduit beside the ducting clips, as there's only one source of DC power at the stern, and I don't want to overcomplicate. To the fan. So I'm now trying to decide which of these two centrifugal blowers I'm going to use inside this box and there's the big one 
and the small one. This draws about 0.8 of an amp, this one draws about 0.2 of an amp. They're both pretty powerful, they're much, much stronger than axial fans, but it's about, uh, it's going to be about the size of the box, and also I just need to make sure that uh, with all the lefts and rights and twists and turns, of which I've tried to minimise, uh, we're not going to lose too much uh, flow and power. I think what I'll do is I'll start with a small one, I'll install it, uh, and I'll keep this larger one just in case. This is a step back in time, obviously, to when the box was still unholed and unsullied, and although both fans fit, I need space for the ports, and the large one which generates a minor hurricane is likely overkill. I've had to add a collar to the blower's intake so it can dock with the pipe, and obviously careful measurement of the outside diameters is needed. Not all of the components are from the same family of products, so there's no real consistency in wall thicknesses and so on. Sadly, I only had a 50 and 60 mm hole saw, so padding will be needed, but the electrics gland is smaller and neater. But look at this. How smart. Air in, air out. And a box that's easy to open for maintenance. I've chosen to locate and wire up the fan towards the duct exit, and so draw air through the system and not push it, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, space management. But more importantly, if there's any oil mist in the engine bay, I don't want it drawn directly into the fan. Instead, it will likely coat the inner surfaces of the first part of the ducting, which is easy to inspect and clean if needed. A filter will rob me of flow. I need to control the mighty 5 watts of power, and I do want the ability to slow down the revs in the event that we need less flow, or less noise perhaps. It's not pretty, but functional is what we strive for. Right, so I've just wired this up for a first little test. This is just a little dimmer which will vary our voltage and that's having 24 volts entering and 24 volts actually exiting too. Goes all the way down there, all the way up here, through there and to our little fan. So let's switch this on. We have a little buzzing sound and then we have lift off, we have movement. very limited flow of air but we have air. I guess I'm only, only probably giving it about 10 volts at the moment. Stonking. But I'll see what flow remains once the ducts are taken into account. That whining sound at very low voltage is annoying so I guess we'll stick to an 18 to 24 volts in practice. This is the system all put together, and yes I did obviously test the ability to draw air all the way from the engine bay and ending up out the silicon elbow at the exit port. The stern section isn't boxed in and soundproofed yet, so the second half can be plumbed in as and when. I did consider showing you it all switched on, but there's barely a sound to hear that you didn't just hear in the test, and the encouraging gentle flow of air can't be well translated cinematically. It works though, and moved around 10 cubic feet of air per minute, which means the air in the bay will be regularly replaced. Next, briefly on the topic of electrics. Now that I'm really starting to populate this little Wago box here, I'm going to make a little map inside the cover so I can label what goes where, because otherwise it's just a load of red and black wires. I've been using these lever terminals a lot. They help build flexibility into the wiring plan and avoid having to chop things up later. However, they don't like ferruled ends, like these I'm making here with my new hex crimping tool for the battery connections in the previous split charger episode which is excellent and you should watch, again and again preferably. Wago and Wago style lever connectors clamp down hard on twisted wire ends, but do tend to reject harder ferrules that prefer to be screw clamped. What a strange end to an episode, and it involves me explaining about Alan to passers-by for the 1700th time and then chopping up some wood. I wonder what the wood is for. To be honest, nothing groundbreaking, but that's fine. Bye. Oh, and we're on the move on Tuesday. Check the AIS then.